So today I'm going to be talking about uh, lab coat safety and a new innovation, a uh, new fabric that uh, we've got uh, coming out for our lab coat here in the near future, and I think you'll find this very interesting. It's quite a quite a good improvement on the uh, lab coats of the past. So first we're going to talk a little bit about FR lab coats and why it's important to have an FR lab coat in a laboratory setting, why Nomex 3A has uh, become the uh, fabric of choice for lab coats, a little bit about an assessment tool that was developed by the University of California uh, system, uh, and then we'll get into the chemical splash protection, which is the new innovation that uh, we're going to be uh, talking about today, and uh, the new lab coat in particular that's both FR and chemical splash protective uh, type fabric used in this lab coat. So why is a uh, FR lab coat needed? One of the things that we ran across about a year and a half ago or so, there's been a number of accidents in uh, university labs across the country, accidents at Yale, Northwestern, one here uh, in California, UCLA, that have uh, caused lots of stir in the uh, lab safety environment, and it really got the whole uh, FR lab coat uh, project uh, rolling in a uh, big way. Uh, flammable liquids are commonly found in labs. Uh, they're all over the place, used in a variety of different uh, situations. And so the FR lab coat is really designed to prevent the uh, clothing ignition. If, you, uh, if you're dressed like the uh, young man on the left there in his uh, shorts and a T-shirt, any kind of a flammable explosion is going to uh, catch his uh, clothing on fire, and it's not going to be a good situation. And what's the whole purpose of the FR? It's so it doesn't ignite, which virtually minimizes the potential uh, burn injuries that you can sustain. In this picture that you'll see here, you can see the gentleman had on a tank top. Uh, his uh, tank top caught on fire. Uh, the sides of the uh, tank top, uh, you can see where it's darker, actually melted onto his skin, which is a very bad thing to happen. But you can also notice that uh, up in the upper portion where you can still see bare skin, and it's not nearly as burned, uh, not nearly as badly as the uh, area where he had the clothes that actually were ignited and burning. So uh, virtually he would have been better off had he not had any shirt on at all. Uh, the exposure is typically uh, of short duration. Uh, and so the key is not having your uh, garment, whatever it might be, whether it's uh, you know a coverall shirt, pants, or in this case a lab coat. Uh, ignite and catch on fire. That's a very bad situation that you don't want to uh, want, don't want to happen. And w when we looked at some of the common laboratory hazards, I actually got this information from uh, a piece that was published by uh, Dartmouth University that talked about uh, common accidents in laboratories, and a lot of them involved fire, explosion, chemical hazards, whether they be corrosives, flammables, pyrophorics. Uh, those types of things, they're not uncommon to happen in laboratories. So you need to be prepared. You need to have on the right type of PPE to address those particular hazards to protect the, uh, the research workers, the lab workers that are going to be in these, uh, working in these types of environments. There's lots of other types of uh, hazards in laboratories, but these are, these are very common. Chemical hazards, uh, fires, explosions, those are kind of things that uh, happen on a regular basis. So you need to be prepared. You need to have your people protected. When I also looked up some information, there's 90 plus flammable and combustible liquids used in laboratories. And you can see this list. It's huge. Uh, there's all kinds of different things in different classes of uh, flammable liquids, whether they be um, ethyl ether, ethers or benzene. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, things used, kerosenes, acid, um, there's uh, phenols, octanol, all, uh, lots of different ones. Some I can't even pronounce, but you can see that there's a host of uh, chemicals used in laboratories that are flammable. So having a flame-resistant lab coat uh, is, is critical to provide uh, protection for the workers. When you look at a typical safety program in the hierarchy of controls to minimize uh, exposure of hazards, you first you look at things like the culture. You want to have a safety um, attitude. You want the uh, workers and the uh, managers to believe in safety, understand what the hazards are, and understand how to protect against them. 
You also want to uh, in, uh, still engineering controls, uh, things that can uh, provide safety, having hoods, uh, having uh, different uh, shutoff valves, and things in place from an engineering standpoint that can help control the hazards. And work practices. You want to do certain things certain ways to minimize the potential for some type of a, uh, a hazard to uh, accident to occur that uh, it's going to injure somebody. And then the last line of defense is your PPE, whether it be uh, eye protection, uh, safety glasses or goggles, hearing protection, breathing protection. You've got gloves for uh, protection against uh, chemical burns and uh, cuts. And you also have lab coats that play a, a critical role to protect the uh, upper body and exposure and uh, cover the uh, flammable clothing that's worn underneath. So uh, lots of different things that lead up to it. But your last line of defense is that PPE. So you want to make sure you have the right type for the right situation for your particular hazard. Another way of looking at it is you can look at the different ways to try and uh, control the hazards. Uh, you're starting off with uh, eliminating it. You know, getting rid of that hazard, that situation, you can use uh, things to substitute for the chemicals uh, or the actions that are taking place. You can isolate them in areas that uh, are going to protect workers. Uh, as we talked, there's engineering controls, there's administrative or uh, procedural controls that can be put in place. And again, PPE is still a critical piece of this uh, laboratory safety, kind of your last line of defense to make sure that the uh, workers are going to be protected. And what does OSHA say about hazard assessment and PPE? They have some pretty strict rules, and it applies to many industries, including uh, laboratories. Um, employers are required to assess the workplace. They're, they're supposed to assess and document what the hazards are and what kind of PPE will be required. That's a requirement by OSHA. And as I said, not only do you do the assessment, but you have to have it documented, Some something documented that uh, explains what the hazards are so that if an ocean inspector ever comes in, you can produce that document for them. It requires you to s select a PPE that will protect the workers from that specific hazard that's identified. And you need to communicate what uh, what your assessment was about, what the hazards are, and why you made the particular PPE selection to the uh, to the workers so that they understand what they're being protected against and how the uh, PPE works. And they need to be trained. How do you put it on? How do you take it off? When and where do you put it on and take it off? All those types of things that uh, go with training, as well as how to deal with the hazards themselves, how to properly work uh, around those hazards. Once you get the PPE, you have to make sure that it fits properly. You can't just get a you know a big pile of lab coats uh, all large and hope that it's going to fit everybody. You need to make sure that the um, garments properly fit each of the lab workers. And then you also have to make sure that they use it. You can't just have them there and they're hanging up in the corner someplace. You have to make sure that it's part of the culture, part of the standard operating procedure that the uh, workers wear and use the PPE properly. And you have to maintain it. If it gets dirty, if it gets stained, if it gets uh, hazardous materials on it, you have to take proper steps to make sure that it's maintained. So you have to do the assessment, document it, select the right PPE, train your people, make sure all the garments and other types of PPE fit, uh, make sure that your standard operating procedures include the use of the PPE and make sure that they're maintained so that they're in good working condition. They'll do the job that they're designed to do. And these are all OSHA requirements that uh, are um, put out there to make sure that uh, people are uh, safe in their work environments. So why was Nomex 3A the uh, fabric of choice from the uh, University of California and many university lab uh, research labs across the country? A couple of things. Number one, it does have very good flash fire protection. And the main purpose for FR, obviously, is to protect against the flash fire you know, from flammable, flammable um materials, uh, igniting uh, flammable vapors, those types of things. And it has uh, extremely good flash fire protection. It's been used in industry for many, many years, and it has a proven track record. And another reason that it uh, was a product of choice, fabric of choice, was its resistance to chemicals. It doesn't degrade when it's exposed to lots of different types of chemicals. Uh, and here's an example of a, a table from uh, DuPont uh, showing the different types of chemicals that it can be exposed to and how it uh, resists uh, 
and uh, doesn't degrade nearly as bad. Now, it's all contingent on concentration, temperature, and the time of exposure, but you can see hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, uh, you can be exposed to and it has minimal degradation. And then there's also some oxidizers and reducing agents that it uh, uh, does well with it exposed to the um, sodium, sodium uh, berborate, hydrogen peroxide, those types of things that it can be exposed to and has little or no uh, degradation uh, from exposure to those chemicals. So flash fire protection and chemical resistance was what kind of led the University of California and many laboratories to choose the Nomex 3A as their uh, lab coat fabric of choice. And one of the reasons they, another reason they went that way is the other FR uh, materials like the treated cottons, they would have a, a much different effect when they're exposed to some of these chemicals. And they even have in their uh, literature, do not use in the presence of strong ac acids or oxidizers. Uh, and the main reason for that is it can actually have an impact, a negative impact on the uh, flame-resistant polymers in the uh, treated cotton materials. So anytime you're exposed to uh, these uh, reducers, oxidizers, uh, and you're wearing an FR-treated cotton, there's potential that it's going to uh, degrade the flame-resistant properties of it. It's not really going to perform when you want it to perform. So just another reason why uh, the uh, Nomex 3A seemed to be the uh, fabric of choice. Now, in terms of actual regulations and standards, if you look at the OSHA regulations, the first one that comes into play is the general duty clause. That uh, has been in place for many years and it covers all industries and basically it says if you have a known hazard you have to protect your people from it. And then likewise with the uh, PPE uh, general requirement, the 1910-132, it uh, basically states the same thing. Do an assessment, determine what your hazards are and then provide the appropriate PPE uh, for the uh, workers that are going to be exposed to that particular hazard. And in terms of flash fire, when you look at the standards involved, you've got the uh, NFPA standard 2112 or the Canadian uh, CGSP standard that uh, spell out the requirements for garments and fabrics exposed to uh, potential flash fires. And those, the tests that are done to um, validate that those fabrics and garments meet the requirement, uh, the two key ones are the ASTM uh, 6014, 6413, which is the vertical flammability test, just to validate its uh, flame-resistant properties. And then you've got your F-1930, which is your um, uh, mannequin test. It's a flash fire simulated mannequin test to uh, uh, spell out what the estimated body burn potential might be uh, when exposed to a um, thermal energy source. So those are the, the, the key standards for uh, flame-resistant properties for uh, fabrics and or lab coats in this particular situation. It could be exposed to ignition sources or flame or heat. So how do you know, if you're in a lab, how do you know what uh, what kind of PPE you might need and when you need a lab coat and when you don't and uh, is it, does it have to be FR, et cetera? Well, the University of California developed a tool called their Lab Hazard Assessment Tool, or LHAT as they call it, and it has a series of questions about different situations and hazards that you could be exposed to that you have to go through and answer yes or no, and then it spells out what the potential hazard, uh, the exposure injury uh, potential is for the worker and the type of PPE that would be recommended. So, for example, if you take just the first one, the uh, working with hazardous liquids, uh, that might be a splash hazard. You're looking at eye or skin damage, poisoning, and so then it talks about chemical-resistant aprons, face shields, uh, gloves, goggles, those type of things. And uh, et cetera, you can see there's a variety of them. There's a whole host of them that are in this LHAT tool. And the University of California is making this available to other uh, university labs or labs in general to use as a guideline to determine what type of PPE is, is needed. <clears throat> this is an example of uh, one category, uh, the C6, where you're working with large volumes, less than a liter of flammable solvents. It shows the injury types here. And uh, PPE includes the uh, flame-resistant gloves, safety glasses, and flame-resistant lab coats that meet NFPA 2112. And then if you bump up to a um, C7, that's working with uh, flammable solvents that are going to be near an ignition source. 
again, similar type of uh, PPE requirements that you would need for that one as well. So it's an easy way to go through a step-by-step -step process to uh, identify what your situations are, what the potential injury could be, and the PPE requirements. So it's a great tool to use to try and uh, assess your situation for your particular lab, which is very important. Now, what about chemical splash? That's something that, um, you know, a lab coat is designed to protect the uh, worker from different things in the lab that could get on them. And chemical splash is uh, another common uh, situation where you're working with chemicals, uh, corrosive acids and so forth that can splash onto you and cause skin burn injury. So when we talk about chemical splash, there are, there are chemical protective garments out there, uh, but a lot of them are flammable and they can't be worn around uh, situations where you could have a fire hazard. So if you have a fire hazard and you also have a chemical splash hazard, um, you need something that's both flame resistant and uh, chemical protective. One of the ways that uh, some of the universities and labs have uh, what they've done to uh, <clears throat> address this dual hazard situation is they've had uh, ap aprons like the one shown here in the picture. It's a um, chemical protective apron. Unfortunately, they're not very comfortable to wear. They don't breathe. They don't cover. They don't cover the entire body. Your arms are still exposed. Uh, it restricts the motion of the workers, and they have to remember to wear them. So you've got to be diligent to make sure they put them on. So it's not an ideal solution. They can have on their FR lab coat, and then if they've got to put on the uh, apron over top of it, you can just imagine that uh, it's not going to be a good situation. It addresses the hazard, you know, for the most part, but it's not comfortable wear, and you have to make sure the uh, worker remembers to put it on because they're not going to want to put it on. It's not, it's not a very good uh, uh, situation to have that uh, dual coverage. So with that said, where have we come from? That situation, how has it evolved? Uh, we worked with the University of California, and uh, we understood their situation with this dual system. And we talked with our partners at uh, West Tex Millican to see if they could come up with a solution. And lo and behold, they come up with uh, Shield Tech, a new fabric that's a fantastic uh, innovation and upgrade to the uh, lab coats. Still made with the Nomex 3A, so you get all the FR properties from the Nomex, uh, and you get the uh, lack of degradation when exposed to the chemicals, but it also has a chemical splash protection finish put on it so that any type of uh, chemical that gets splashed onto it is going to shed off uh, quickly, uh, any kind of splashes or drops that are going to be on it, and it doesn't wick through the fabric onto the wearer. So it does a great job of um, protecting against these uh, incidental chemical splashes. So you've got your dual hazard, FR and CP, chemical splash protection. It's comfortable just like a uh, regular fabric. And it's breathable, just like your regular Nomex 3A. So it's, it does the hazard protection of both hazards. It feels good to wear. It's breathable. Uh, you know, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Here's a little video we'll show uh, that was developed by uh, Millikan showing how a piranha solution, which is 70% sulfuric acid and 30% hydrogen peroxide, and what happens to it when it's poured onto the the new shield tech versus when it's poured onto the current uh, fabric that's being used. You can see um, he's mixing up the uh, solution, the uh, sulfuric acid and the peroxide, to get a typical uh, solution that's used for cleaning glass items in a laboratory. This is uh, something that's used uh, pretty much in every laboratory. First going to pour it onto the, uh, the new shield tech, and you can see it'll pool up on the top. It basically has no reaction. And this is worst case scenario because it's in a horizontal situation. Now when you pour it on the current fabric, wow, look how that just burns right through in just seconds. In no time flat it goes through there. Just a world of difference between uh, the two of them. It's, uh, it's kind of a cool thing. Now here's a top view, and again, you'll be able to see how the uh, piranha solution pools up on top of the shield tech. And then when you pour it onto the... Uh, current fabric, boom, right through it goes, nothing flat. So if this was splashed onto the uh, garment currently, it's going to burn through. 
And as I said, this is worst case scenario because it's in a horizontal situation. When you're, you know, standing in front of a uh, lab bench, uh, obviously you're going to be in a uh, vertical situation, so it's not going to be bad. But even in this worst case scenario, you can see how well the shield tech holds up. Now here's a, um, showing a I'm going to show another video that shows a variety of chemicals, as you can see listed on the bottom, that have had a dye added to them. So you can see how the uh, the liquid and the dye penetrate and wick through onto the backing fabric just to see how uh, how that affects and how shield techs work in that situation. So this is the uh, current product that they're using, drops of all the uh, different uh, liquids with the dye, and you can see how it wicks right through onto the backing fabric and nothing flat. Here's a side view of it. You can see how quickly it spreads, how quickly it soaks through, wicks through the, uh, the outer fabric of the lab coat right back onto the clothes, whatever was being worn under e underneath. Now, when you do it with the Shield Tech, same product, same chemicals, and look at it. It just slides right off, sheds off, right down off onto the table. No wicking, no uh, penetration through the fabric. Isn't that, isn't that fantastic? Look how that stuff goes. It amazes me every time I see this video how well it works. Just a great improvement on uh, what they're currently using out there. So, in essence, when you look at the new FRCP lab code from Workrite, we're, we're talking about it's using proprietary shield tech fabric. It's dual hazard. Still the Nomex 3A for flame resistance, but with the chemical splash protecting finish on it uh, to cover both hazards. It's very lightweight. It's only four and a half ounce. Very breathable. I think it's 200 uh, cubic feet per minute air permeability, which is very good. Soft, comfortable to the feel. Uh, and this new one's even softer than uh, a lot of the standard Nomex 3 edge you might find out in the marketplace. One of the things we did was we put a black collar on it. The standard uh, lab coat has the same color collar as it does the main body fabric. We put a black collar on it so it's easily distinguishable between which ones are chemical splash protective and which ones aren't. And we also have the label on the back that you can see in the picture that shows the FR and CP so you know if somebody's wearing the right uh, right lab coat. It has the knit cuffs so that it keeps uh, your uh, sleeves from getting into uh, experiments or knocking things over. And we also put pocket flaps on the uh, two waist uh, area pockets that uh, people use to put in gloves and notes and whatnot. We decided to put pocket flaps on them. That way, if you spill, splash some uh, liquids up onto your chest area, and it's going to run off, like you saw in the uh, video. It's not going to run and fill up your pockets. It's going to continue to run right past. And we make them in men's and women's styles, just like our current uh, lab coats today. So a great host of uh, properties that this product has that uh, we think is going to really revolutionize lab coats in the uh, lab safety uh, environment. And here I'm going to play you as kind of a closing video. This is uh, some comments made by a gentleman, uh, Craig Merlick. He's associate professor of chemistry at the University of California uh, down in UCLA. He's also executive director of their Center for Lab Safety. And and Craig, along with one of his uh, other partners in lab safety, uh, Ken Smith, uh, were instrumental in working with us and with Millikan to develop this product. They they expressed the need for it. We passed it along to uh, the Millikan uh, scientists, and uh, they came up with this fantastic new shield tech. So I'm going to play a little clip of what uh, Craig's thought were on this product. I absolutely think that the new coat will meet our needs. It, it provides the same or better level of flame resistance that we currently have, but our current lab coats are not chemical resistant and they are not splash resistant. This new lab coat uh, is superior in all regards um, for those factors. That's pretty much it. We appreciate uh, coming to our webinar today. We think this is a fantastic new product. The uh, lab coat does lots of great things. Uh, the Shield Tech fabric is fantastic. Uh, we're going to be uh, producing these things in the uh, first quarter of 2016. So uh, 
Uh, they'll be out there waiting for you when you uh, get back after the uh, first of the year. If you have questions about this or any other uh, WorkRight products or any questions about anything related to FR, you can certainly email me at msainer at workright.com. You can go on our website. We'll have some information on there about lab coats. So uh, we think this is going to be a great thing for labs and uh, appreciate you coming today.